folks, Pitt, Tennessee, can Pitt slow down Hendon Hooker? And can they score enough points to keep up with the Tennessee Volunteers? It's all coming up on this crossover edition of Locked on Pitt. You are Locked on Pitt, your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Panthers. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Folks, we're going to get into the Locked On crossover with Eric Kane of Locked On Vols. But first, I want to get you guys a little preview of my thoughts here. Today's episode of Locked On Pit is brought to you by Upside. Download the free Upside app and use promo code LOCKED to get $6 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. And folks, I want to talk more so about what this game actually is going to mean for Pitt. Because we'll talk about Hendon Hooker and Pitt against Tennessee and all of that very soon. But what you don't see is actually what this could mean for the programs at large. And I think this is a huge game for Pitt um, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, I think Pitt needs to come out of this game with a win. Because here's the thing. If they lose this game, they could drop out of the top 25. Clearly, and I mean this, clearly there is not enough respect there for Pitt because they didn't even gain a spot after being West Virginia. And so Pitt is in a bit of a tenuous spot here where they're kind of in limbo, if you will. If they lose this game, they could drop all the way out of the top 25. If they win this game, they could go up 13 to 12, somewhere like that. It's a vast difference and a vast perception difference too. Pitt needs to win this game for a few reasons. One, for that perception reason. Two, there's a ton of recruits coming into town, including Hakeem Williams and Ryan Wingo. Two five stars. Five stars. you got five-star players coming in. You have all of this coming into form, folks. This is so important for Pitt to win because it also shrugs off that kind of feel that you have of, well, Pitt didn't beat anyone worth a, a crap. And, and people will say that about West Virginia. People will say that about their ACC schedule. Uh, perpetually, it is viewed as a weak conference. But Tennessee is an SEC program with legitimate expectations this year. We're not talking about just anyone in that regard. We are talking about a team with Hendon Hooker and a legitimate High octane team. They're an offensive team, and it feels like a different style of team than what Pitt has gone up against thus far against West Virginia and what they will go up against for a long, long time on their schedule. So, this is huge for Pitt perception wise because a top 25 win at home as an underdog shows, well, we shouldn't have been underdogs. You know what we should have been? We 100% should have been respected. We should have been the favorites. We were the number 17 ranked team, and we're Pitt, and we're here to stay. And that's the type of stuff that Pitt needs to cultivate. Pitt has to cultivate that type of feeling around the program because right now, people are still doubting Pitt. They're still doubting them because they lost Jordan Addison and Kenny Pickett. Well, what better way to prove you're here than by winning this game? And quite honestly, I don't want to overlook West Western Michigan, Rhode Island, Georgia Tech, or Virginia Tech. But those teams are clearly worse than Pitt. If Pitt wins this game, you're staring down 6-0. and And that's a top 10 ranking coming with it. You are staring down a 6-0, and 2-0 conference record right away. Right away! That's That would be huge for Pitt. You know, the hype around the program at that point would be insane. Then they would go into their bye week, ready to go and come out of it at Louisville. This could be huge for Pitt, and this is a huge perception-based game. And we talked all about this. We talked all about how much perception matters, recruiting-wise, certainly. But just for your bowl game. For, the, for your program at large to draw revenue, to get eyes on your program. There are eyes on Pitt's program 
in this one too. There are. There were eyes on Pitt against West Virginia, and now there are again. You have a nationally televised game on ABC at 3.30 in a ranked matchup. You want to talk about where the eyes are going to be. They're going to be on Pitt in this one. And Pitt's going to have to step up to the plate and produce something that they haven't had yet this year. And they haven't had the opportunity to do, despite what many see as what would be a gutsy win against West Virginia. This is huge for Pitt. Pitt needs to step up and take Tennessee to the wire and win this game because of that perception. It means a lot for the program. It means a lot for the rankings. And rankings are perception. You can say as much as you want about how little those mean and how much you actually put stock into those, but they do mean something. They mean the buzz around your program. They mean the headlines that are being written about your program. They mean the attention your program gets on a day-to-day basis. And the more you get, the better off you usually are as a program. The more money you bring in, the better recruits you come, the better the football is on the field. Usually that's what ends up happening. And Pitt needs to regain that. Pitt was once that, but it's been a long time. And Pitt wants to become a sustained program. And we talked about this. Take the leap up, right? If Pitt wants to go into the next tier of teams, if Pitt wants to be with the Michigan States of the world, even up there with Penn State, another season where they go about as far as they did last year, even further than that, is required. Pitt has to prove that they are worthy of that. Pitt has to prove that people need to pay attention to them. Because right now they're getting disrespected. That line on better line is up to seven and a half for Tennessee. The money is coming in for the volunteers, folks. Pitt is being disrespected right now. And there are reasons why that is. Certainly. But also, it doesn't have to be that. Pitt needs to prove a lot in this game. And perception-wise, it's huge for Pitt. All right, folks, we're going to go over with Eric Kane to talk about the Vols. But first, folks, I want to let you guys know about Upside. From from cringing at the pump to getting an eye-popping check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting hitting us all where it hurts, and it really hurts right in the wallet. That's why I started using Upside. Upside is an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out. With every purchase, purchase, I'm earning cash back with Upside. To get started, download the free Upside app using my promo code LOCKED and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit or debit card, and get paid. In comparison to credit cards, rewards, or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week. That's probably why they have a 4.5 star rating on the App Store. Download the free Upside app and use the promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code LOCKED. We got a Locked On crossover edition and it's Locked On Vols meets Locked On Pit. I'm Eric Kane, Nick Faribault over there, host of Locked On Pit. And you know, we were joking off the air, man. It's it's been exactly one year since we spoke. We we talked we talked uh it was your first week with the network last year and uh Tennessee and Pittsburgh. Now round two of the Johnny Majors Classic. I think uh I know Tennessee fans are jacked up about it. I'm sure Pitt fans are as well. Yeah, they are. And this is a big contest for both teams. Uh, for Pitt, I think that, you know, they, they stayed stagnant in the AP pool this week for Pitt, stayed 17. I, I think they felt a little disrespected by that. Uh, they, they thought they'd be a Power 5 team, they should move up. Well, what a better way to prove yourself than against another ranked opponent in the SEC that really looks to be on the ascent. So I think Pitt fans are jacked up about that. And I think all, obviously the Johnny Majors Classic, the lore about it, it, it's just great. So you, how can you not be jacked up? about that type of football game. Hey, real quick, are they um is there a statue of, of, of Coach Majors going up? Is that is that the big uh thing with what Pitt's doing this weekend? Um is that accurate? Uh yeah. So that'll be a big thing. Um and obviously Johnny Majors has been so influential to both these programs. It's it's like a match made in heaven. It's like why didn't this happen yeah. earlier? Um so it's gonna be great. Yeah, yeah, I really can't wait for that. I hope and I've heard rumors I hope Tennessee wears orange pants because Coach Majors love the orange pants. So we'll have to see about that. All right, Nick, this Pitt team, man, um, no more Jordan Addison, obviously. You've talked at nauseam about that this offseason. 
No more Kenny Pickett. You've talked at nauseum about this this, this offseason. But Keaton Slovis comes in. I think that he can do well with the play-action pass. Played well against West Virginia, only 16 attempts. But it looks like Pitt, no more Mark Whipple, wanting to run the football. Even when there's no success there, they're going to want to run the football. Is, is that an accurate take? I'd say that last week was a little bit of an outlier. Um, I think there's a mode to this offense that they showed a little bit in the second half where they went shotgun and really tried to, to spread them out a little bit more Mark Whipple style in that regard. Um, but I think there's like three modes to this offense. There is that run heavy approach that they tried to, to use early on in that West Virginia game. But I also think there's kind of a hybrid approach to both of those where they spread you out, out of under center and work and shotgun. And then there's obviously the pure uh, shotgun empty set stuff. I, I think Frank Cicchetti's offense has a lot of different modes to it. And I think there's going to be a different mode to this offense this week than it was last week. So I don't think you're going to see the seven offensive linemen this week. I think what you're going to see is, three, four, five receivers, empty sets, spread them out. Um, you're going to see 30, 40 passes this week. And that's what Frank Sinead's talked about. We're not going to be stagnant in one game plan or area. Yes, we're going to run the football more than, say, Mark Whipple did. But if that's not working, we'll adjust. And they did adjust last week when the running game was not working in the first half. What they do? Go shotgun. They decided to run the ball a little bit less. And eventually the passing game opened up the rushing game. And so Frank Sinead will make those in-game adjustments and he'll say, okay, if the running game's not working, we're just going to pass the ball uh, to death on you. And so I think that's something that they're still feeling out. I think Keen Slovis and, and Frank Sinead are still kind of feeling out what works with each other. Um, but I, I do think that, that there's more of an emphasis on running the football, but I also think that this is a versatile offense, and they're going to do whatever works best for the game plan. You know, it's interesting, uh, the the ability to adapt and, and, and change a little bit. It's week two, and you're right. You're still kind of filling that out right there. But you got a quarterback that can do – he can do that. He's not Kenny Pickett, but Keaton Slovis is a good player. I mean, he is. Obviously, look at his career at Southern Cal. Last year when Tennessee played Kentucky, Kentucky threw their game plan out the window, and Will Levis threw it 30 times by halftime, more so than any time uh, – more so than any two quarters – throughout his entire career in Kentucky, and I forgot what he finished with. But, I mean, Kentucky went pass for pass with Tennessee last year and trying to keep up with them. I'm intrigued to see maybe Pitt adapts a little bit to try to keep up with that high-octane uh, offense. So uh, that's interesting. I'm glad you told me that. That offensive line you mentioned, all experienced guys, you return like four or five, and, and as you mentioned, at points of time, there were six and seven offensive linemen out there at one time. They're all experienced. You got Jared Wayne on the outside. Got a former Tennessee guy and, and – um, Gerard, apparently he goes by Bub Means now, but he's on the outside. And then you got a big tight end and Bartholomew. What do you like about the – obviously the playmaking ability of Addison, Addison – um, Jordan Addison's not there anymore, but still return a lot of guys to this offense that had success a season ago. Yeah, it's it's an interesting group because it's a lot of transition, as you mentioned. Um, the, the lead dog of this group has clearly been uh, Kanani Mumfield. It has been the Akron transfer who was a freshman All-American – he was really good last week, too. Probably should have had more yards in it, probably a touchdown or two. Uh, him and Slovis aren't quite on the same wire yet, you can see. Uh, first play of the second half against West Virginia, he was wide open. Slovis thought he was going to go in a little more. He kept going wide. And so they, they should have had like an 80-yard touchdown, but it ended up being incomplete. Um, Mumfield's a great route runner, so he'll be uh, the lead dog in this race. I like these receivers. I don't think they're quite as good as they were last year, obviously with Jordan Addison and Taysier Mack and all those guys. Um, but Means is, a, is an athletic, high upside guy. You know who Jared Wayne is, solid player. Um, and then you got Jaden Bradley and Jalen Barden, these two guys, um, Barden a real speedster that, that can take the top off the defense. Bradley more of a size guy that wins a lot in contested catches. Um, between Wayne, Means, and Bradley, all those guys are six foot two or bigger. So Pitt has a little bit of size in this room um, this year. Bartholomew obviously is rock solid. Um, and, and this running back stable is also a, a really good part of this team and why they are so comfortable running the football a lot because they have a Bandy Kanda, Hammond, Davis, Flemister, even Daniel Carter, their fullback, has gotten involved. So it's a wide array, array of weapons. And I think it's a pretty solid group. I don't think it's quite as good as it was last year. Um, but I think it's a, it's a decent group that can stress most defenses in the country. Yeah, you had three guys last year that logged over 100 carries, and – uh, the leading guy in that regard, Davis, as you mentioned, didn't even log a carry uh, in week one. That's kind of how deep that Pitt is at running back right now. Let's flip the script. Defensively, Pat Narduzzi, not happy. Not happy whatsoever with the way his team was rushed, was ran all over uh, against West Virginia. Now it's a rivalry game. You throw everything out the window. It is what it is, right? 
an experienced front seven in the in, in the front with Baldonado and Cansey, and then you bring back a Dennis at linebacker, who's a really really good player. That front seven, who I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, returned six players who garnered all ACC honors a season ago in first, second, or third team or whatever. What's that defense going to be like this year? What are the challenges for that defense in regards to covering this tempo offense for Tennessee? Yeah, um, it's an it's a defense that is experienced in the front and in the back, um, but the linebackers are where you have a lot of transition. Um, this defensive line returns everybody but Keyshawn Kent. And another thing, obviously, is Desmond Alexander, one of the captains of the defense, hurt his shoulder against West Virginia. We don't know if he's going to play. Um, so that could be a big factor. But his replacement, John Morgan, had three tackles for loss and two sacks. He's really good. He's grown into his own. He's a senior leader as well for this team. Um, so look out for him. Uh, the corners are our strength of this team. Pitt's cornerback room might be better this year than it was last year. MJ Devonshire uh, had a really great game against Tennessee. He's grown into his own. You hear Pat Narduzzi just Big raving six. about this guy. Yeah, you just hear him, you know, kind of raving about this guy all summer. And you're like, well, what's that going to look like? And then he comes out and puts on a performance like that. Obviously, Servasier Dennis in the middle there. But Bengali Kamara, young guy playing at its star linebacker position, had a bit of a rough game last week. Uh, that's going to be something to look at. He's inexperienced. He had a great first half and probably just as bad of a second half as he had in a good first half. So he's an up and down player. We don't know much about him. He's had flashes, but it's a question. Shane Simon, the money backer from Notre Dame, super athletic where he makes unbelievable plays that could change games. And then he can do that on the opposite end too. So this linebacking core is a little inconsistent. Um, and they don't rotate as much as they did last year. Last year they were six deep. Now they've played mostly the three guys here. But Pitt's also probably going to be missing Brandon George, their backup Mike linebacker. So Sebastian Dennis is going to be stuck in the middle even though they want to move him around. So that's going to be the thing with this defense. Um, slowing down. Tennessee is going to be tough, obviously, just because of the type of defense Pitt runs. That Pat Narduzzi defense is not meant to stop this type of offense, especially a quarterback like Hendon Hooker. Hey, last thing I got for you a lot. I got two things for you. I'm sorry. I, there's just so many things I want to ask you. I read last year's Pitt defense was second in the nation in sacks, but was 12th in the ACC against the pass. How was that possible? Why could you be so great in getting after the quarterback when it's all tied in? and then give up, I think it was like 274 through the air. What was your take on kind of how that worked last year? Yeah, well, look at the run stats, too. They're great run on run defense. Well, what's Pat Narduzzi's defense built on? Stopping the, the stopping the run. That's what yeah. it is. I mean, they play quarters cover zero all game. And what that means is they're blitzing their linebackers a lot. They're bringing their safeties. Uh, that D-line, it, it doesn't matter. They are selling out and shooting the gaps as, as best as they can. So, Really, your safeties and your corners, and last year this was a very inexperienced secondary. So this was a secondary that had a lot of transition. Now they're more experienced, but this was a secondary that quite honestly didn't have any help. They never do. That's kind of the, the story of Pat Narduzzi's defense. So basically Pat Narduzzi is willing to, to allow some explosive plays, and, and those stats will rise up a little bit in the passing yards because he thinks stopping the run and forcing those turnovers by being aggressive up front is what will allow Pitt to win games. And obviously last year, I think he proved to be somewhat right about that. Yeah, okay. I guess that makes sense. And, and obviously, Pat Narduzzi is a run-first defensive coordinator type head coach. Last thing, you mentioned a couple of guys, the, a little bit of an injury bug. Deslin Alexandre, we'll see about him, the backup Mike linebacker. Uh, hearing rumors about Rodney Hammond Jr., who had a really good game against West Virginia, and, and some maybe some injuries on the offensive line. Any anything to that in terms of the health status heading into tomorrow or yeah, to so Saturday? Some, yeah, so some health things. Um, when you talk about Dustin Alexander, the shoulder injury, they don't really know quite yet how long he's going to be out. He could play this week. It's from what I've heard, it's an injury that is serious enough where he might need surgery, but he can maybe play through it. Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly what that injury is, but um, we'll see. It's going to be a pain thing, apparently, with him. Um, with with George, he's been out a month plus now, um, apparently, with a high ankle sprain. So maybe he returns now. Um, it's about six week injury. He's, he's right along that timeline, so maybe they get him back. Um, when you look at Gabe Hoy, the starting right tackle, didn't play last week due to an injury. Uh, Mac and Salvas, the backup, got benched for Branson Taylor, the third string right tackle, who ended up being really good. So I would expect Branson Taylor to get the start. Um, there. I expect Hoy to be back maybe against Western Michigan. Um, Rodney Hammond, they thought it was a minor 
minor ankle injury, went back, and it was worse than they thought. So what I've heard is three to six weeks for him. He's probably out of this game, no questions asked. So Pitt will be out. We'll be without uh, Rodney Hammond Jr. is what it sounds like uh, in this game, which is a big blow to their offense, obviously. Yeah, well, at least you have depth at running back, that's for sure. But uh, no doubt about it. He got 16 carries, and I think he had two receptions against West Virginia a week ago, and he was a big uh, – a big guy for that uh, that Pitt offense. But that's what you need to learn about Pitt. We'll get you what you need to learn about Tennessee from a Pitt perspective. Nick will take over. When we return here on this crossover edition, it's Locked On Vols and Locked On Pitt. Folks, welcome back to this Locked On crossover edition, Locked On Pitt, Locked On Vols. I'm Nick Farrell with Locked On Pitt. And Eric Kane here from Locked On Vols. And, and Eric, we just had a great discussion about Pitt and what they did, but I have a lot of questions about this Tennessee team. Now, yeah. last year, th- there were a lot of fans that seemed like were very happy with the, the season Tennessee had just from the, the, the progression point from what Josh Heupel did. Now this year, how is this offense different? A lot of familiar names on that offense that I think a lot of Pitt fans will realize, obviously starting with Hedden and Hooker, but you have guys like Cedric Tillman, Jalen Hyatt. Princeton Fent had a big game against Pitt last year. Jamari Small, Jalen Wright, like a lot of these names are very familiar names. How is this offense different or better than it was a year ago? Well, it's kind of funny because last year at this time, Cedric Tillman was not Cedric Tillman he is right now, right? I mean, Tennessee fans knew who he was, but he didn't do anything in three years and really didn't get going until like game three, game four of last year. But he's a completely different guy. Obviously, Hendon Hooker, Pitt fans know who he is because he came in for Joe Milton, but he ascended and kind of took off there as the season went on. So this offense playing with a lot of confidence. You break eight school records a season ago, and you finished top ten in the country, uh, number th- two in the SEC behind Alabama. Um, you know, Georgia, who won the national championship, actually finished third. A lot of people say it's just defense there. They had an explosive offense, but Tennessee was better than them. Playing with a lot of confidence, but I do think that you can expand on the playbook a little bit more. Now, if you go back and watch the tape in Ball State, Tennessee ran like five, six plays. Tennessee didn't do hardly anything, okay? Um, that will change against Pittsburgh this week. I think because Hendon is in his second year behind, you know, uh, uh, under center, if you will, I think his understanding of the offense a little bit better. I think you can do more with that. Uh, move the H back around a little bit more. At points in times, only half the field was in play, and you had a rod receiver standing still at the bottom of the, uh, bottom of the screen last year. I don't foresee that happening a whole lot. And also – can Tennessee improve in the red area and on third and short? That's That was two areas for Tennessee that it struggled a season ago. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, they didn't do a whole lot against Ball State, but Tennessee's offense will do a ton against Pitt, in my opinion. Pitt's been really good in the red zone and the third down, so that's a very interesting point. That's a strength of theirs. But I look at this wide receiver room, it's a little bit different. Tillman's there, Jalen Hyde's there. Jimmy Callaway had a big game against Pitt last year. Um, but Brew McCoy's here now. You have some younger guys in that room as well. What about this wide receiver room is different, the same, and what's the expectation for this wide receiver room? How much speed is there? How much finesse is there? What type of wide receivers does Pitt go up against this week? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. It's a fast group, but the starters, the starting three, Tillman on one side, McCoy on the other, they're big, physical on the outside, fast enough, but they're big, physical, you know, short-term explosive guys. That's what Hypo likes on the outside. In the middle, you got Jalen Hyatt that is quick, can take the top off the defense, all that type of stuff. Behind those guys, you mentioned Jimmy Callaway, who honestly has been kind of a forgotten man, but might have the most talent of anybody in the room. But Callaway's got speed. Freshman Squirrel White, who's 5'10", 160, has a ton of speed you'll see in the slot. Walker Merrill, who will come in, has got some speed. Jimmy Holiday is one of the fastest guys on the team. He'll come in. He's got some speed. So it's a very fast group kind of behind, you know, Hyatt's got speed, but kind of behind those, uh, the trio of starters that that jump out there first. But the expectation is to to pick up right where you left off last year. Uh, Tennessee didn't really know what they had in Bayless Jones or Devontae Payton or, or Cedric Tillman for that matter. I mean, it was all unknowns and they kind of, you know, carved out roles as the season went on. They're still trying to do that. Those receivers didn't play a whole lot against Ball State because they rotated so much, but what you need to know is on the outside, big and physical, and then whenever you bring in the reserves, if they do rotate, you're going to get a whole lot more speed in there along with Hyatt in the slot. Now, this offensive line, I think, is the key for either team because the trenches are going to be huge in this game. If they can get pressure on Hendon Hooker, I think this changes a lot of things. Now, obviously, headline by Darnell Wright, and he is a great player. But what about this Tennessee offensive line encourages you against such a really good defensive line that Pitt brings 
or maybe worries you against this pick defensive line? Well, it's a veteran group, obviously, and it's a little bit of a smaller defensive line, but but very athletic, you know, and, and that's something that Jerome Carvin, a fifth-year senior offensive lineman, spoke to, to, to reporters a couple of days ago. And, um, yeah, he's a guy that's like, we, we've seen this bunch before. A lot of these guys are the same guys we played last year. They're quicker, they're more athletic, they're not as big or bulky, so we kind of know kind of what their their style is, know that they're well-coached and all that. So, um, you know, it what gives me um, – I, I guess optimism for Tennessee in, in regards to this question would be just like Pitt's defensive line, Tennessee's offensive line, they're, they're all veterans. Four of the five are starters returning. Uh, Javante Spragans was a full-time starter last year at right guard. Of course, Cooper Mays, who got banged up in this football game a season ago and missed it, um, he's returning at center. Darnell Wright, as you mentioned, is at right tackle. Jerome Carvin's at left guard. And then you've got a position battle left tackle to where, all, to, to where you know potentially you have Gerald Mincy, who's – maybe the most athletic guy of the bunch. And so you pair him with Darnell Wright, and that's a pretty good tandem at tackle. So at the experience factor, they played a whole lot of football. This offensive line will be healthier, as I mentioned. Cooper Mays missed the game. Cade Mays got banged up at right tackle last year, missed a whole lot of snaps. And so at Tennessee overall was just not healthy for this football game a season ago. Of course, Milton goes down, which might have been a, bl- a blessing because Hooker you know, came in. Um, but Tennessee was down two running backs last game, down a right tackle, down a center, down some guys on defense. So, you know, we'll see. But the the leadership and, and the um, the experience of this offensive line is something I think will help. Now, the running backs will have to step up. The tight ends will have to stay in for six-man protection sometimes. The running backs who are young will have to be, you know, well in your pass pro because I expect Narduzzi to send them and play some games up front. Now, let's switch over to the defense. Uh, this This Tennessee defense – complicated story had moments where they showed out last year but the passing yardage per game isn't very good uh, 122nd in the nation uh, it, it, it's a tough defense when you look at to kind of evaluate how is it different this year they returned some of their top guys in terms of some of their stats um, but what about this defense is their strengths what's their weaknesses overall well it's funny because the defense struggled so much a season ago towards the end and you lose three draft picks from that defense. And so you're like, oh, my goodness, you know, what's going on? The biggest difference is Tennessee has depth in places where it had no depth a season ago. Remember, you know, one of the national storylines, obviously, was, you know, the, the the black eye of Jeremy Pruitt leaving. And then, of course, you know, hiring Josh Heupel. But all these players that just started for the transfer portal during that transition, Tennessee's numbers were horrific last year. Tennessee played three linebackers. Um you know, four linebackers early in the season, then Juwan Mitchell, um, who's questionable for this game as well, uh, missed the rest of the season. But Tennessee played three linebackers. Tennessee didn't trust anybody else other than the Trayvon Flowers and Jalen McCullough to play safety. Um, the difference is this year now you'll play a lot more corners. You'll play two nickelback spots. You'll play a couple of different linebackers. And really on the defensive line, they'll be rotating in and out every single uh, series of the football game. So, that's what the, the the main difference. Now, will this team take a significant step? We'll see. I think it can, even though it lost some talent from last year. I just think at points in times where you were having guys like Aaron Beasley and Solon Page playing so many different snaps at linebacker, and they just had no help. They were tired. No one could come in and play for them. Quite frankly, at times they weren't good enough to be on the field. But you're an experienced team now. You have a year on your belt, and you have guys that can come in and play. That's the biggest difference. Tennessee's rush defense was pretty good through the first, you know, five six games of last year, and then again, it just kind of fell off. We talk about good teams have depth to win in the fourth quarter. Good teams also have depth to win in games ten and games eleven of the season. Tennessee just didn't have that last year. Now, when you look at the secondary of this team, the obvious big name missing, Alante Taylor, um, from this matchup last year. There's a little bit of transition there. You have Tamarian McDonald, you have Warren Burrell, you have a few other guys in that secondary. And you still have some experienced guys. Obviously, Trayvon Flowers is a, is a very experienced name that I think Pitt fans are very uh, used to. How do you look at this secondary right now going up against some of these Pitt receivers when they – that's probably Pitt's strength offensively is just how good their wide receivers are. Yeah, we'll see. Um I like to marry McDonald in the star position. He had an interception play number one against Ball State. Again, I know it's Ball State, but you know that was good to see a guy that came in here and held off a transfer from Georgia Tech and Wesley Walker all fall camp and and won the job and they got a pick on play number one. I really, really like that. At quarterback, you lose Elante Taylor. You bring back Warren Burrell, who's been a three-year starter. But 
Um, Burrell has been picked on a ton, had a horrible Music City Bowl, had a bad couple of games there to end the 2021 season. And Ball State watched the tape, and they, they went right after him. And I expect Pitt to go right after number four at corner uh, in this football game. So I don't know who's, who's going to be on, if it's, if it's uh, Wayne or Mumfield or whoever it is. Look for Pitt to go after number four from the beginning. Let's see how Warren Burrell responds. But Kamal Haddon's the name you need to know. Number five. Uh, it's a junior college guy. It was a little a little injury prone a season ago, his first year in Knoxville, but he missed most of camp this year. I don't know if he'll start because he's trying to work himself back, but you know, played 16 snaps, graded out the highest, and had interception last week. He is a playmaker at cornerback who will continue to play more and more and more. So I like Kamal Haddon, a new cornerback as well. Christian Charles didn't play in this football game last year. Actually, he did, he, not de- on defense. He blocked a punt on special teams and set up Tennessee at the two early in that football game, but he's an impact player at cornerback. So, again, it's just about having more options. Tennessee didn't have options a season ago. They played the same guys. That's where I think you, you might lose some some serious talent in, in Theo Jackson and Alante Taylor, but you have three guys who can come in and play now, whereas you just had one guy last year. I, just, I, I really do think that'll help Tennessee. We'll see the step it takes, but I think it will take some type of step just from the depth. Then when you look at this – defensive line you have a lot of talented guys on that defensive line you look at guys like Byron Young uh, Tyler Barron in there it looks like what is a pretty solid defensive line and again I think this game is going to be one of the trenches on both sides of football what about this defensive line stands out to you I think there's a few names that do but as a unit what do they do extremely well well, I think they're athletic. I think Byron Young um, is a guy that can change a game. Um, he he was kind of – he and Tyler Barron both were kind of non-factors against Ball State. Tennessee didn't have a sag. Ball State was getting the football out pretty quickly. There's a couple different contributing factors there. But uh, Byron Young and Tyler Barron will need to play well for Tennessee to win this football game, in my opinion. They need to get in the backfield. They need to take advantage of the uh, the injury situation that Pitt's having at right tackle right now. So, you know, whether – I think that's Tyler Barron. But nonetheless – you got to get in the backfield. Uh, defensive tackle, Maury Thomas is a good player. He's now a three-year starter. He plays a lot of football. Kind of uh, a big question mark of the other defensive tackle. They rotate that all across the board a ton anyway. Karat Garland, Elijah Simmons, DJ, DJ Terry. Uh, but I do think this this defensive line is athletic and quick. And they've got some guys who can come in uh, behind them and then really get out of the pass. Their freshman, Joshua Josephs, uh, James Pierce, Roman Harrison. Those guys will get in uh, and play a little bit. It's kind of funny. I think you're going to have an athletic bunch going up against a very experienced bunch. And so, you know, if, if, if the athletic team can run around the experienced bunch and, and get to the quarterback, I think that'll help Tennessee uh, an awful lot. So I just think the front seven overall is going to have to, you know, play well, stop the run, and then stay at home as well because I, I believe Pittsburgh is going to hit that play action pass over the middle and try to try to gash Tennessee a couple of times in the first half. Well, folks, there you have it. Tennessee going to be a ranked matchup here in Pittsburgh. A lot of firsts here for Pitt. First time hosting an SEC team, actually at Acrisure Stadium. First ranked matchup at Acrisure Stadium in a very long time. So a lot to go on here, folks, for this game.